Hi, I'm Diana. And I'm Susanna. And you're listening to Global Caveat, the podcast where we demystify global health. Today's episode is about nutritional epidemiology and communications with guest Kiona, an entrepreneur and activist with a PhD in nutrition epidemiology. So this episode is going to be the first of two episodes with Dr. Kiona, and this episode in particular will focus more on nutritional epidemiology. Okay, let's get started then. Hi, Kiona. Good morning. (laughs) Um, Hi. Thank you so much for uh, being our guest today. We are super excited to talk to you. But before we start and dive into more about your research and just different topics, um, could you just tell a little little bit about yourself and maybe how you got into your field that you studied and also any information that people can reach out to you on? like your social media or your email? Yeah, um, so my name's Kiona, and, uh, Dr. Kiona. <laughs> Since we're doing science podcasts, I never introduce myself that way. But um, So I got my PhD in nutritional sciences. I have a master's in statistics and data sciences, master's in nutritional epidemiology, and um, a bachelor's in sports medicine. Um. And you can reach me at how not to travel like a basic bitch.com and the Instagram how not to travel like a basic bitch. Same on Facebook, same on Twitter. So I know those are super random non science y uh, handles. But. <laughs> and yeah, and I think people know you more for those platforms, right? You talk a lot about travel. Yeah, definitely. The, the social media platform is definitely. Uh, not I don't want to say it's not science related because I feel like all of my training and research I bring all of that to the table like what when I did my PhD it taught me like everything about how to do research how to question sources um, how to perform an experiment how to introduce bias so it's definitely influenced by science if that makes any sense so um, I was asked to be here to talk about the science aspect of my life, which I do talk about sometimes on the platform because a lot of people who do follow along are academics and um, or are wanting to be academics or have dreamt about being academics and it just hasn't been accessible to them. So I definitely have touched on um, introducing racism or introducing bias into science and how that affects like the world because it does and it definitely affects travel also. So that's kind of where like the two worlds come together. Yeah, I can definitely see that in your material and I appreciate it a lot. Um, So yeah, then let's talk more about some of your research that you've done maybe or any projects that you are currently working on if you are. Um, But we could start anywhere. Is there any that you'd like to start off with or? Yeah, so... I guess I should clarify um, my degrees. So my master's degree is titled a master's in nutritional science, but within nutritional science, there are multiple divisions. And my division was epidemiology, which people hear epidemiology and they're like, what are you talking about? They think skin (laughs) and the dermis. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, uh, yeah, I was like, they're like, are you a dermatologist? Like, no. (laughs) So epidemiology is just simply the study of diseases across populations. And then since I'm nutritional sciences, it's studying the nutritional aspect of those diseases or nutrition related diseases. And I think people don't understand that nutrition is involved in like pretty much every disease. Um, Because if you think about it, like what builds, what's the like makeup of your DNA which is amino acids, which is protein, which is like what you would get. I mean, the body makes its own, but also it requires um, nutrients from food sources to build your DNA. So nutrition is heavily involved with disease. So we study everything from cancer to diabetes to cardiovascular disease. And people don't normally think of nutritional science as the backbone of studying diseases, but it is the root of a lot of things, if that makes sense. And how did that carry over into your PhD degree? Yeah, okay. So um, my master's in nutritional epidemiology, where I was taught 
Um, and it fed into my master's in statistics because when you do population wide studies, it requires really elaborate statistics, um, especially to account for like such a varied age or ethnicity or anthropometrics. So I had to get, I didn't have to, but I got an entire statistics degree in order to analyze that data. And then that fed into my PhD, which is nutritional sciences, but it's actually on a different level. So I study the microbiome, which is the bacteria in your stomach and basically how it breaks down nutrients and how it feeds the body and the presence of certain nutrients feeding certain bacteria, and then the presence of different bacteria in your stomach affecting chronic disease later in life. So just, just I just feel like people hear that I like do nutritional sciences and they're like, oh my gosh, like what should I eat? And um, how do I get gains? You know, I'm like working out all the time and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, it's not really my field. So like dietetics is a completely different field and they are the people that you would want to go to for that kind of advice. And I want to say that registered dietitians is a legit license and they go through an intensive training process. And if you ever see anybody call themselves a nutritionist, that is just some hoax like I don't they're just randomly calling themselves that registered dietitians are the people you need to hire for meal planning any sort of like exercise health all of that I guess suggestions to like eat like I would probably take from a registered dietitian over a PhD or over an MD even like they're the experts in that realm I didn't know that I always thought that registered dietitian and nutritionist were like the same thing before moving on, I just want to expand on that point you made about someone saying they're a nutritionist that doesn't mean that they're actually qualified to help you with your nutrition or diet, right? So nutrition science is a field focused on behaviors and social factors, dietary concerns, health issues related to food eating and medicine. It's based in chemistry, biology, and the social sciences. You can use nutrition science in a bunch of different ways and Kiona uses it differently than someone that is a dietitian would use it. Having said that, a registered dietitian or an RDN is someone that has gone through rigorous schooling and is certified and has to take board exams and continuing education specifically for the science of nutrition and they learn with the intent of advancing the nutritional status of people around the world. People out there are calling themselves nutritionists, they're not always certified, and you don't really have to go through any type of schooling to call yourself a nutritionist, but a lot of people that are dietitians and RDNs do call themselves nutritionists, but they also list their credentials. But they also list their credentials, so always be on the lookout for that. Anyways, having said all that, let's get back to this conversation and back to what Kiona does. So Kiona, can you explain what the microbiome is and why you studied it? Yeah, <laughs> I can try. Basically, there are like trillions of bacteria in your stomach. And the bacteria are needed to break down the nutrition, like anything that you eat. But if you feed the bacteria something repeatedly, then bacteria will proliferate to digest that thing. So for example, if you're eating a lot of fats, then bacteria that digest fats will proliferate in your stomach. And then like vice versa for like plant. And so, and then the bacteria will break it down and then it leads to absorption. But oftentimes we think a calorie is just a calorie. But if you think about it, when you ingest something, whether it has 50 calories or 70 calories, it really depends what you're absorbing. Everything else gets pooped out and you're not actually absorbing some of those calories and or some of those nutrients. So a lot of times when, um, when we are making these diet plans or suggestions or whatever, we really don't ever take into account bacteria and how that determines what you're digesting, what you're not digesting, and therefore like what you're absorbing. So basically my, my project was making a diet, a diet profile associated with certain microbiome profiles so that we could see what people were eating resulted in which bacteria that were in the stomach. And therefore you can eventually create change by like introducing different bacteria into the stomach so that different things are digestible and absorbable. So like they did this test in mice where like they gave mice with no microbiome. Yeah, they gave them no microbiome and then one with a microbiome. And they found 
Basically, the mouse with no microbiome had unhealthy profiles comparative to the one with the microbiome. And then they've studied this in humans also. Not They didn't like change their microbiome at all, but they just studied like a group of kids in Italy versus a group of kids in Burkina Faso, Africa. And they found that the Italian children had, um, I guess, worse microbiome profiles because they were high in fats, high in calories. Um, and their proteins were like from meats, whereas the African children had a better, and I say it in quotes, I know nobody can see that, but uh, it's all relative, right, to like health. So they had a better profile because they were eating proteins as legumes, and they had lower calories, not to say that low calorie was good, but it was higher calories and protein. And they had less incidences of E. coli in their stomach or salmonella or all of those bacteria that we consider as bad because they make you sick. And that wasn't something that they expected because, you know, the Italian children children grew up in a highly sterile environment. There's hospitals and things like that, whereas the Burkina Faso children um, didn't always wasn't like what we in the Western global North think of as sanitary. And um, they just had like built in mechanisms with the food that they ate. And uh, it it ended up in like a decrease of these like bad bacteria. So that led to like all of these studies going on about like what's good bacteria, what's bad bacteria relative to like the disease that you're trying to prevent. Now does your microbiome, can it change if you're placed in a different environment and you start eating different foods? Yes, definitely. It takes a long time, though. So I actually got really interested in this project because I got E. coli poisoning three times. And I could not understand why I was getting the same thing like three times, right? Like, what am I doing wrong? It was actually because I got E. coli poisoning once and then I took antibiotics and the antibiotic killed my entire microbiome. So I had no um, buildup built in. And so I just continued to get the same thing over and over. Also, I was like traveling and like exposing myself to like bad bacteria. But it made me realize that the absence of a microbiome led to like really unhealthy profiles. And not only that, like I lost so much weight. Uh, Like I'm already like pretty small, but I lost about 10 pounds, which looks really sickly on my body to the point where my mom like tried to have an intervention. She thought I was anorexic and I had a disease. And I was like, no, mom, I'm just sick. I just don't have a microbiome. So uh, it took me a long time to build it up. And I was really intentional with like how I was building it. So like by introducing like largely like plants or leafy vegetables um, and legumes as protein, I was building um, a new microbiome profile that combated E. coli or salmonella or, or these things. But it took a whole year to build up. And then science has proven that it takes a year to like change your microbiome profile. But you can definitely change it with the types of food that you eat and the environment that you're in. Also, the environment affects your microbiome. Like whether you live with a roommate, whether you live alone, um, all of that stuff is like exposing you to like different bacteria. Like whether you were C-section born or vaginal birth, those are all different exposures to um, different bacteria. And it affects all of it affects your microbiome. So basically, my master's degree of epigenetic or epidemiology was studying how those exposures was affecting chronic disease later in life. And then we realized that, well, before we analyze that, we have to analyze the microbiome. So there's my PhD. That's a lot of information. Yeah. And just a lot of it. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) But it's really interesting because I feel like um, it's funny because someone did ask me, they're like, what is a microbiome? And I was like, you know, I don't think I'm the right person to ask. (laughs) I know. It's kind of complicated. And it's such a new field. Like they like really in all reality, we don't even know. Like we know what it is, but we don't really know how to analyze it. That was another thing. I had to build my own like statistical tools to measure this data because it hasn't been done before. When you measure a population, there are definitely methods in which you follow to to adjust for bias or adjust for population. But with microbiome data, we haven't even figured out all of the bacteria in the stomach to be accounted for. So it's like I had to like build my own stats model to like analyze it, if that makes sense. Can you talk more about how you built your own model and what you used that for? Yeah, it was for the microbiome one. So it was like, how am I supposed to compare one profile Mm. to the next? We don't even know all of the bacteria that that have um, been collected. And even like the methods of like analyzing the microbiome is like, 
really complicated process of like extracting fecal DNA <laughs> from a ton of people and then running it through the centrifuge. Well, you ha- you extract, well, you have people poop in a plastic mm-hmm. bag, basically. Well, okay, we give them wipes. <laughs> We give them these like (laughs) diaper wipes and you're supposed to wipe your butt with it after you poop and you put it in a bag. But like when we got, when we got the samples back, people were pooping (laughs) inside the bag, (laughs) which that's like awesome data, right? (laughs) But, and also we found like hairs within on the like diaper wipes. So we had to like remove all the hairs because that's like a different type of DNA. (laughs) And then, um, and then like we like ran it through the centrifuge and that's how kind of how we get the DNA extracted. But like, if you think about it, fecal DNA is what we like poop out. So like, is that really reflective of like an active microbiome? Like, Mm. we don't know. So it's just like, we can analyze the data all we want, but like, there's all these like different methods that like haven't been tested and proven yet that like, we're just shooting. And like, honestly, that's what science is, is like shooting in the dark until you like, slowly figure it out. So that reminds me of the fecal transfers. Yeah. So they've been doing this too. Um, If you consent to it, you can do it, but it's not something that like is prescribed or anything. But yeah, they literally like put one, somebody's poop and put it in another person's body. Um, and it's like to transfer microbiomes and it's actually been pretty successful, except in the case when you actually transfer not good bacteria. So like they've been, some people or one person that I know has used it to lose weight. So they, I think it was like the mom gave her microbiome to her daughter and so their weight became the same, but then her daughter also got all of the intestinal problems that her mom had. I don't remember exactly the details of the case, but like their microbiomes matched, hmm. good and bad. That what? That doesn't seem real. <laughs> I know. But so I don't think that they've like really perfected it and I definitely wouldn't give that recommendation to anybody, but they have been testing it out there, so potential development in the future. We'll see where that goes. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine, like, weight loss pills, like, eat this poop. Poop in a pill. (laughs) Yeah, poop in a poop in a pill. Now I want to look it up. Can I buy poops? Okay, (laughs) so I looked it up, and there are, in fact, poop pills, and they do exist, and people use them, and they have been shown to not be an inferior method to the colonoscopy for preventing things like C. diff infections. They've also been used for managing weight loss, for obesity, and for IBS, so yeah. Poop pills are real and used. Great. So that's cool. That's a thing. So before this podcast, Kiona, you and I spoke just a little bit about like past projects. And I know in your master's, you said you did uh, maternal and child health. Right? Yeah. Could you just tell us a little bit about what work you did within maternal and child health? Yeah. My project was basically analyzing like one of the biggest studies that has ever been done called the Nurses Health Study. Um, the nurses health study is when like a bunch of scientists started sending out questionnaires to like nurses all over the country, or it wasn't like all over the country yet. It was like in like 13 states or something. Can't really remember, but nurses have a really high response rate, but it was a lot of nurses who sent back the questionnaires fully answered. And, um, they were pretty, I think there was some sort of accuracy measures and they were pretty accurate in what they reported. So they just continue to do this. And I want to say they did it every other year. So it's changed throughout time. And this like started in the like, I want to say 40s or 50s that they started sending these questionnaires out. And it's changed throughout time. Like it's changed, like if they send it out yearly or bi-yearly or every five years. And then they've also expanded it to be like of all ethnicities and before like the nursing industry was like predominantly white um and female so oh yeah and that's another thing they were only taking like female nurses so the methods have changed over time which means you have to adapt that into your statistical model but the person that i was studying under sent questionnaires to the mothers of all of those nurses so that we got historical data from like 1920s and basically i analyzed what were their like maternal habits like whether they were like getting delivered by c-section if they were breastfeeding uh if they smoked if they were married all of these things and how it affected um breastfeeding status in the child and then at that point we also have because it's so much data from like 1920s those nurses 
unfortunately have passed. So we also have data on how they passed. So what diseases they were being that had developed. So at that point, we can correlate like whether breastfeeding was correlated with the incidence of certain diseases. It's been a really, really important study for breast cancer because of this like historical data. But the reason why I even got into taking generational data is because I had done a ton of research on what I basically, there's this problem in the United States where African American babies have the highest rates of low birth weight. So I think like white children have 6% and then black children have 12%. And it is known in the science community or health community that a low birth weight baby leads to really bad early onset of chronic diseases. And this has also been a fluent problem in the African American population, which is like the population that I live and work in. So it was something that I was definitely interested in. And um, in my research of generational like passing down of like health, I realized that there was something very, very special to the African population that they were experiencing these low birth weight rates. And that when African children were analyzed, they had the same rates as white children, but African American had double those rates. And so I was like, what was different about African American and African? Because clearly that's not genetic because they share pretty similar genetics. So to me, that introduced history into it. So what did African Americans go through that Africans didn't in the United States? And um, I mean, the obvious answer to me was slavery. And slavery means that there was also an undernourishment. So because slavery was a business, slave owners took really detailed records of production of one slave and how much they were ingesting, because that would be a like how much are they spending and how much are they like getting back from a, from a slave because they were viewed as property. And they kept incredibly detailed records of this. And also the type of food being given was like a lot of cornmeal. Meat was usually not given. And if it was given, it was given to men because they usually had to work longer hours and in harsher conditions. And then they also kept really good records of births because that also contributed to the economic success of a plantation. So we found that these slave women were giving birth um, at like average of like 14 years old. So they were all underage in that they were, they themselves have not reached the peak of their nutritional status. So all of the food that they were ingesting was also going to their own growth as well as the growth of their child. And the fact that they were women meant that they weren't eating as much meat protein. They were getting different types of protein. And looking at the records, on average, it was like 6,000 calories a day were being expended and 3,000 calories a day were being ingested. So they weren't being starved, but it is an undernourishment. So looking at all of these records, I came up with this hypothesis that may actually have been tested by now. I'm not even sure that the undernourishment led to the babies being probed, their cells being programmed to be really efficient. So they were coming into um, an undernourished state so that they would be able to extract a lot of nutrients from um, the food that they were given because their cells are very efficient. When you introduce an overnourished environment to a baby whose cells are extremely efficient because they're predicting like an undernourished environment to come into, that leads to chronic disease like diabetes or cardiovascular disease because your cells have not adapted to an overnourished environment. And this has actually been proven with famines in Sweden and then in Norway or Holland or somewhere in Scandinavia. During the Holocaust, they went through year, a couple years, like four years of undernourishment or starvation famine because their um, their trade was blocked so they didn't have a lot of food and they found that like the women who were pregnant during the time of that gave birth to low birth weight babies who then later on developed chronic diseases or early onset of diseases so just applying that what happened then to the pregnant women during slavery and then it being generational right because that was like a 500 year thing And then now introducing like an overnourished society, my passion, I guess, was to find a signature in the DNA that could be altered so that people no longer experience that. But you'd actually have to have, you'd have to find what it is that's causing it in order to alter it. So, yeah. But um, when I tried to go find uh, the data for this that I could analyze, the guy that I wanted to work with had thrown away all his blood samples. So 
Oh, what? That's yeah. Sucks. I just I just worked on white women nurses and finished my masters. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I would be so devastated if I found out that the data that I needed was just... Yeah. Why would he do that, though? Why would someone just throw away something like that? That's such useful information. I know, and it sucks in academia. It's like, I had done all this background research, and I found this guy who had like a ton of blood on African Americans and whites, so that you can like do a comparison. And then you have to create a proposal, and then you have to submit it in order to ask him permission to use it, right? So, like, I had done right. a semester's worth of work just to ask him to use it, only for him to be like, oh, yeah, I don't have it, you know? I threw it away. <laughs> and, like, my professor was like, because I was like, can I just ask him, like, if he still has the data? She's like, no, you have to come in with a plan, which that's valid, but it's such a waste of time. Not, I mean... <laughs> It would have been nice if you had the data, but then you, I mean, all this information, though, it's still, like, really rich, I feel like. Yeah, for sure. It definitely, like, changed yeah. my worldview on health when I realized that, like, when we say generational trauma, it's not just emotional, it's, like, scientific as well. And, like, we definitely pass it down in our DNA, literally. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, like, I know Susanna has told me about how she might be studying the indigenous population. And like, it was already difficult for me to like access, you know, African American DNA or African American information. And just doing statistics on that is like, kind of questionable, because it's hard to reach like underserved populations, especially ones that don't visit hospitals, or there's just like a lot of societal blockades to access um, the people that need to be accessed. And then, you know, Working with the indigenous population is, like, I would say infinitely harder, in my opinion, just because there's, like, urban natives, reservation natives, there are, like, tribal laws, and that that sucks. Like, that shows how society or our um, system makes information hard to access for our marginalized populations. Yeah, finding data and people that have collected data and owning it is hard, and then having to go through that entire process just to find out that it's not even accessible anymore is a huge barrier in trying to study these populations, right? I think the more I learn about people's research and then the more I look at just different global health research topics, historically, things like studies that have been done about nutrition or chronic diseases or any disease for that matter, if we do have information or data on people that aren't like the general white population, the information that we have, it's consumable, like we, it's available to us, but the methods in which this information was obtained, I'm like, how did this happen? And I feel like people often forget that part where the ways in which this information was obtained, there was a lot of power dynamics going on and a lot of things that happened where the, like, that's the reason why the, some of these populations don't trust scientists. Yeah. And it's very valid that they don't trust scientists because even within the United States, we have so many violations in our past. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of those studies are people dropping into somewhere, asking a bunch of questions, and then just not giving the information back to the community and making all of these statements to fill in the gaps, but they're not really respecting the people there, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Um and then are they even really collecting data in a way that really contributes knowledge or adds any type of new information? And then how do you even get into finding and accessing those people to get the data now with all of the distrust, right? So Yeah, that I, I was on a study that was trying to redo birth charts to include multiple ethnicities because currently they're based, I think they were like, made in the 1970s and they were based on like white children and obviously we grow at like different rates I think I mean again I, I need to go back in the research and I think it was like really funny how I think Asian babies are like larger than the average but they're not like larger humans because like we're, our growth charts are just we grow differently and then African-American babies were really small and they grew really fast so and like have larger anthropometrics later in life so it was just really interesting how, like, we're stacked on these, like, growth charts that, like, don't exactly relate to our genetics. Anyway, so in creating those growth charts, we needed to um, have a very large sample because if you're, like, breaking it down by ethnicity, 
I mean, that just like gets, and then there's like mixed babies and then there's like all of these other things that like get introduced to it, but you have to have a really large sample in order to even do those stats and to have the power to do it. And we had to go, I mean, like it was pretty easy to get a white sample and actually pr- not that difficult to get an Asian sample because we went into daycares and there are like very like Asian specific centers that you can like find that data. And then a lot of like university professors were bringing in their kids to daycare. So it was easy to still access like Asians, including Southeast Asian. But it was really difficult to access the African-American population. And that was the same like distrust, you know, like what you're, you're asking me for an hour of my time to like measure my kid and touch my kid. And like, what do I get out of this? And so, I mean, we we paid participants, but we couldn't pay them in dollars. We had to like pay them in gift cards. And then even that was like a thing where it's like a lot of the communities that we were going into were food deserts. So it was like food desert means like where there's no access to like fresh foods in the area. So like people are getting their groceries from the corner store, not an actual grocery store because there aren't any in that neighborhood. So if we're in a community where we're collecting data and there's a food desert, well, what, where can we give them gift cards to access food? So, you know, we were giving them, we just had to like adjust that to like whatever was closest, which is usually like a Walmart. And that's where like you're getting your groceries. And also it was like people who didn't look like them were taking their data, you know, where it's like this whole entire process, I felt like I think it was good that they were trying to do it. And this is like, like I said, science is like shots in the dark, like you're trying, but it's also like we should have trained and hired collectors that looked like them that made them feel safe. I mean, there's just like a lot of sensitivity training that like probably could have gone into that. But we did hire like community liaisons so that like we weren't just like, scientists like coming into your community and like measuring your child here's the gift card you know like we definitely wanted like an introduction to it and a lot of thought was put into that project so that it wasn't like an abuse of power but not all scientists are that good like I was grateful to like work under somebody who did think about ethics in science a lot and then I worked with people who don't think about it at all and it sucks like it made me feel really uncomfortable being in projects that I ethics aren't taken into account nor are they accounted for like who right like no one's in these communities watching us like take this data um i mean the irb but i guess not really since they're not physically there but going back i have a question what are anthropometrics oh anthropometrics i'm sorry so anthropometrics are like simple things like height weight uh body fat it's just like the actual measurements of your body Ah, right. Okay. And did you have to come up with different measures for some of the projects that you did? Or is there like a standard set of measurements in anthropometrics? So there are golden standards, but in that we were also developing different tools for measurement. So like, I don't know if you've ever measured a baby, but they move a lot and they scream a lot and... It's a really uncomfortable situation when you're trying to measure a child in front of their mom and it is like screaming bloody murder as you like try to measure their arm span and you like have your arms on this like child to like measure their arm span and they're like, ah, they're like screaming and you feel like you're torturing the kid. Like, oh my gosh, am I like inducing some like, like trauma? Yeah. So we, in this process, we also developed a tool that will like help people in clinics, um, especially with moms who like just don't have the time to just come and, you know have their height and weight and arm span and whatever, or like even like measuring feet, like babies like kick a lot and like you're measuring their feet and you have to like kind of force them to stop and they do not like it. So um, we did develop our own tool, which was like to measure um, arm, a forearm, because the forearm measurement can be like a supplement to height, I think. So like instead of like, you know, asking a kid to stand up, babies can't usually stand up and they're like forced onto this like, um, like this floor situation where we have to like pin them down. Um, we, we thought that maybe we could just measure their forearm and it won't be as invasive. And so we created this tool that basically would account for like, what is the correlation between a forearm and height? And then you could just measure their forearm and they like put it on this, like really like this paper with stickers and like you just measure their forearm really quickly and we just like mark it and then it's done instead of like inducing this like trauma onto this baby. 
So that was really cool that that tool was developed. And I don't think that it would have been developed if we we didn't figure out that like it might be traumatic <laughs> um, measuring these babies in that way. So I can't imagine having a baby screaming and then I know you're like, like I'm really sorry. <laughs> And then, like, you have all these, like, you know, toys and, like, squeezy things and, I don't know, it's just interesting. Like, people are like, what are you doing today? I'm like, oh, I'm measuring, like, 50 babies today. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, like, a lot of baby talk all day and, like, I don't know, I just feel like people don't even think about that as science, but, like, kind of is. Yeah, the nitty-gritty parts of science. Yeah. <laughs> so, at least from what I'm hearing, a lot of the research that you've done, I mean, they're all super interesting. Like, you... and it sounds like you're very conscious, like intentionally conscious of the history and the cultural context that these people are placed in that present itself physically in terms of things like their microbiome in their stomach or, you know, how they grow up. So this might be, I guess, more or less an obvious question, but if you just had to describe to someone like how all this has shaped your understanding of health disparities what would you say um i would say whenever i see a health disparity statistic um the first thing i think about are who exactly did they measure how did they measure them and then this is a current statistic but has history ever been considered in this statistic it's really really easy to manipulate statistics and Honestly, it's like I've taken a year away from academia and started my own business that has nothing to do with academia. Um, it, it definitely is something I would like to approach again, but it's really hard knowing how easily statistics can be manipulated on purpose and manipulated not on purpose. That when people hand me data sets, I feel this ent- huge responsibility to be entirely ethical and have my work double and triple checked, which people don't actually do. They hire your you as a statistician and then really good labs will have it um, double checked by another statistician. I've been in labs that don't do that. And then they go on, publish their data, and then that data goes on to influence policy. And if you don't have people on the inside processing the data and collecting the data that's on your side or advocating for you, those statistics come out really wrong. And to me, that's like, for lack of a better word, like heartbreaking and made me really question if I wanted to continue to participate in a system that doesn't advocate for people with health disparities, keeping in mind like what exactly they're shooting for, which is to alleviate those health disparities. I don't feel like some of the labs that I worked in um, did that. It was like more for grant money because when you have, when you introduce a diversity component, there's a whole lot of untapped resources and which includes funding. So it's like, do you really want to cure this or do you really want to like help this or are you working yourself out of a job by curing it? So this is just not something that you're really advocating for. You're just collecting like miscellaneous data just to say that it's like a diversity thing. And oh my God, that really bothers me. And so I don't know, I just, I always talk about taking up space and I advocate for people like taking up space, but also like just for me, the cost of that to my mental health just like wasn't worth it. So I took a break and like maybe I can approach it, but I definitely feel like the system is broken and isn't safe for people who are advocating for equal rights because it's an unequal system. Oh, absolutely. With that said, we'll end this episode here. Be sure to tune in to the next one to catch part two of our conversation with Kiana. And that's the episode. Make sure to look out for part two coming out in two weeks with our guest, Kiana. Thanks to Kiana for joining us. As a reminder, you can find her on Instagram at how not to travel like a basic bitch. And please subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Seriously, we're on nine different platforms. And please leave us reviews. We'll print them and put them on our refrigerators. Yes, please. Your support helps us grow. You can also support us by becoming a member of our Patreon page. Suzanne and I spend a lot of time making sure our information is correct. But there are only two of us, so if you catch something, please let us know. You can find all the resources from this episode on our website. This episode is also transcribed. Feel free to reach out to either of us by emailing globalcaveat at gmail.com or to either of us on Instagram 
at Cladalus and at Sujani. And a special thanks to all the people that have to listen to us brainstorm and to Cordell Glass for producing our music. 